This is Southern Arch Heretic, Shifting the Burden, continuing with the proof and starting with the cosmological argument. I'm Kit Rogers, and I have some questions. What other reliable evidence can be presented by the believers aside from testimony and references to portions of a holy book from thousands of years ago? I must admit, when searching for physical evidence to be presented or scientific evidence to be presented on behalf of the believers, I come up short. There are numerous accounts of so-called modern miracles that are attributed to God, by the way, this occurs with other gods in other places and throughout history as well. However, these are just anecdotes, and when you dig into them, you usually find few eyewitnesses, a metric ton of inconsistency, and a boatload of hearsay. These miracles, also by definition, are suspensions of the natural order, and so using the data and contemplations of scientists to argue for the existence of God while believing in miracles is a contradiction I just can't wrap my head around. I've studied and reviewed many attempts by Christian apologists to employ the rules established by particular scientific fields of study, physics, astronomy, biology, mathematics, and the like, to argue for the existence of God, but when I attempt to simplify these arguments to their core, I always reach a point where faith becomes necessary. I have searched far and wide for sources that convince me otherwise and have yet to find one. I've heard other atheists comment in debates and in their books that if someone could prove God scientifically, that person would win the Nobel Prize for science, and so far no one has. I know that some believers contend that faith in the scientific method is analogous to faith in an all-powerful, all-knowing God that has a plan for you. However, this is a false equivalency. Since the normal understanding of the term faith and its definition, as it refers to religion, is belief in God based upon spiritual apprehension rather than proof which I interpret as a personal feeling requiring no evidence. I'm not sure faith is the proper term when referring to reliance upon the scientific method. In all honesty, I find it curious and confusing that people of faith feel the need to make proof arguments. Faith and proof in the same thought might be a paradox, if not an oxymoron. <laughs> Science and the scientific method require skepticism and doubt. Faith necessarily exists without it. In fact, God, according to Scripture, specifically forbids it. The entire purpose of science is to continuously and vigorously test our understanding of the universe in hopes of proving or disproving certain hypotheses. The beauty of science is that it doesn't matter what the result is. We learn from it. Faith in an invisible, omnipotent, omniscient creator God that intercedes, but for some reason likes keeping its existence a secret, is a little different. A person of faith presupposes the truth, and then when faced with new evidence, attempts to arrange any new data so that it supports that truth and reaffirms their faith, 
then we'll go even further to discount any part of that new data that doesn't. Okay, so I think I've laid a decent foundation for my premise. The arguments that I'm going to attempt to explore and the general primer on some of the overarching legal issues. These will be fleshed out more as we go along, but now to the actual God question and the alleged proof. The Cosmological Argument The cosmological argument has existed for as long as there have been notable philosophies, going all the way back to Plato. It is a means by which proof of a creator can be inferred through study of the cosmos, our known universe. The argument is based on the premise that things exist, and things that exist must have a cause. For Christian apologists, the argument is that the universe exists. Everything that exists has a beginning and an end. The universe began to exist and will end, and so must have a cause. And so that cause must be an all-powerful personal God. The reason the cause must be an all-powerful God is that it must exist without a cause and therefore be the first cause. The first cause must be something or someone for which existence needs no cause, for which existence is its very nature. Therefore, God is existence. Now, at this point, a Christian apologist may provide a biblical reference. For instance, God names or defines himself in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 as, I am. The argument really seems to rely on the premise that all things, and especially things in series, are finite, except God, of course. Although I understand that mathematically the infinite is difficult and can cause some issues with calculation, what I don't understand is the need to conjure a complex being that is infinite. We know that certain objects exist, and that space and time exists. At least we think so. I guess we could be living in a simulation. We know that we are learning new and amazing things about our universe on almost a daily basis now. We are seeing deeper into space and farther into the past than we have ever seen thanks to the advances in technology. When we ponder the Big Bang and the nothingness that preceded it, we have some confidence in our understanding of what followed the bang part. However, we are still very much so pondering the nothingness. We're still learning. I'm sure there are many wondrous things that we have yet to discover about our universe and ourselves. I'm equally certain that those wondrous things, even if unrecognizable or unknowable in the moment due to our ignorance, will eventually have a scientific and rational explanation. The history of our civilization supports the premise that scientific discovery has enabled our better understanding of biology, chemistry, nature, medicine, aeronautics, propulsion, physics, Large particles, small particles, weather, food preparation, sanitation. Shall I go on? Oh yeah, and the ability to carry a tiny computer in our pocket. It acts as our communication device, social outlet, research device, news source, entertainment hub, matchmaker, food ordering device, medical provider, calendar, wallet, camera. It even tells us where the fuck we are and how to get where we're going when we finally leave the house. Whereas religion, and or faith in God, has given us prayer and supplication, divinely bestowed power to individual humans, mostly men, claiming infallibility, or at least a direct line to the master, 
mass killing and war in its name, and has allowed those in powerful positions, supported and enabled by the acquiescence of the faithful masses, to convince perfectly rational people to abandon the quest for knowledge, unless it is knowledge authorized by God or God's conduits, you know, folks to whom he whispers that secret knowledge, other humans. And I suppose centuries spent torturing and killing people that espoused any scientific theory that contradicted the church's official stance couldn't possibly have had any dampening or stalling effect on scientific discovery. And sarcasm may not be that helpful here. But then again, I can think of some other things that haven't been that helpful when it comes to the enlightenment of humankind. The cosmological argument always leads me to contemplate the question of the chicken or the egg. Which came first? Oh yeah, God. There are different versions of the cosmological argument, but the basic premise is the same. Where a scientist or a, a non-believer may contend that we generally accept the Big Bang Theory, but there are just still queries to be made, and we are only at the beginning of our understanding of the expanding universe. Christian apologists see the Big Bang and are suddenly enlightened and perfectly willing to opine See there? Science has proven a beginning. Hey, that's good enough. We know the rest. And fundamentalist Christians, especially literalists or creationists, they'll contend that science is just wrong. Hey now, buddy, listen here. If it ain't in the book, I reckon the good Lord don't want me to know it. The skies are strewn with stars. The skies are strewn with stars. The streets are fresh with dew. A thin moon drifts to westward. The night is hushed and cheerful. My thought is quick with you. Near windows gleam and laugh and far away a train clanks glowing through the stillness. A great contents in all things, and life is not in vain. William Ernest Henley, 1877 One of the most influential thinkers in modern Christian apologetics and a proponent of the cosmological argument is Dr. William Lane Craig. Dr. Craig's version of the argument can be summarized as follows. One, Everything that begins to exist has a cause. 2. The universe began to exist. 3. Therefore, the universe has a cause of its existence. 4. Since no scientific explanation can provide a causal account of the origin of the universe, the cause must be a personal God. I have read Dr. Craig and watched him debate some of the individuals labeled, you know, lovingly, I'm sure, as the new atheists. There really is nothing new about us, if I may paraphrase the late Christopher Hitchens. We're just the current atheists. Dr. Craig is an impressive and formidable debater. He's well organized. He uses references to Buttress's argument. I've nothing but respect for Dr. Craig as a debater and as a reasonable voice for Christian apologetics. I'm only referencing him due to his position and in influential writing on the subject. If you read Dr. Craig's work on the subject, and I impress upon you that you should, you will find a well-organized and thoughtful approach by a seasoned philosopher and writer. However, 
even with references to mathematical and scientific theory, the argument ultimately reaches a point where faith becomes necessary. Dr. Craig attempts, as most Christian apologists do, to use modern scientific findings to support his argument. The problem I have with this tactic is that science continues to change and evolve as science does, presenting new obstacles and questions. The true brilliance of the scientific method is that it teaches us how little we know. The believers, on the other hand, presume an answer and manipulate their argument to hijack certain scientific theories and hypotheses and the data associated with those theories and hypotheses in order to confirm their already understood truth. Again, it, it seems like a strange endeavor. This goal of attempting to make scientific evidence prove a non-scientifically derived fact. Faith requires no evidence. And that is the ultimate problem with it. You are welcome to have faith in a creator God, but the Christian apologists cosmological argument, although it is presented as a proof in the philosophical sense is not proof and literally offers no evidence, much less reliable evidence of an infinite personal creator God. There are many other hypotheses related to what existed prior to the Big Bang. What if the nothingness before the Big Bang wasn't really nothingness? What if there was once a contracting anti-universe, where the comparative measurements of matter to antimatter, dark energy to light energy, dark matter to dark antimatter, visible matter to visible antimatter were all reversed? one that no longer exists but that contracted to a singularity of energy and radiation with minute amounts of remaining antimatter and matter which then agitated in a near complete annihilation reversed the majority from antimatter to matter and exploded into the big bang forming our expanding universe it seems like the majority opinion is that dark energy which may be the catalyst of the expanding universe, makes up 69.4% of our universe. Light makes up a very small percentage. Dark matter makes up 30.1% of our universe, which leaves visible matter making up only 0.5%. Our universe contains significantly more matter than antimatter. As we travel back in time toward the Big Bang, the amount of matter and antimatter become more balanced. This would result in the process of annihilation, which produces energy and radiation. When matter meets antimatter, boom! Annihilation. Doing my best John Madden impersonation there. Boom! Anyway. What if a now non-existent contracting anti-universe in which the measure of antimatter was greater than matter, each becoming more equal with the anti-universe's contraction, reached the ultimate point of annihilation, the universal reversal, or as we call it, the Big Bang. And that's the origin of our expanding universe. We can think of the nothingness prior to the Big Bang as the energy and radiation that formed from the annihilation resulting from the contracting anti-universe. That energy and radiation excited the remaining matter and antimatter, causing the reversal and so the Big Bang was the midpoint of the annihilation, the ultimate point of the transitional annihilation. The movement from a dying, contracting anti-universe to the expanding universe we now know exists. Since dark energy is arguably the force behind what we now understand to be an expanding universe ever increasing in speed, 
and if we take infinity out of the equation, it makes sense that we're racing at an ever-increasing speed toward the limit of the dark energy, the catalyst. When this limit is reached, the reversal of the expansion must begin, and our universe will begin to contract back toward the origin of the Big Bang. Dark energy's limit creates an outer border of the universe, if you will. As our universe contracts and the matter begins to balance with the antimatter, the energy and radiation from the annihilation would cause the reversal, the transitional annihilation, the anti-Big Bang causing the amount of antimatter to surpass the matter and begin expansion once again into the anti-universe until the catalyst energy behind the expansion, I don't know, maybe light, reaches its limit and then reverses and so on 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 and so on. Does it seem reasonable? I have no idea if this hypothesis has been put forward or tested or proven to be false already. I didn't do any more research into the actual science and data other than online searches, review of some encyclopedia entries, and stuff I just recall, arguably incorrectly, from reading articles and books on the subject. I just made it up. So if I'm repeating ideas already proposed, and I'm sure in some way I may be, I'm doing it unwittingly and with admitted ignorance of the subject matter on any scholarly level, specifically the mathematics and data derivation methods. I have read Dr. Lawrence Krauss and Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, as well as some others that spend their time actually working in the hard sciences, but just thought that this might be a reasonable and or fun explanation for the cause. Maybe a cool comic book anti-universe with light energy as its expansion catalyst and a shadow reality ooh, is what existed prior to our universe. Can it be proven wrong? Maybe, but I haven't seen that argument yet. Luckily, the non-believers have no obligation to prove anything. If this hypothesis or any portion of it seems reasonable to you at all, then I submit to you that you have a reasonable doubt as to the cosmological argument for the existence of an infinite personal God. As I said, I'm no scientist, but my kick-ass shadow world anti-universe hypothesis seems a more feasible explanation than, let's look no further, God is the answer. Next time we'll dig into some more arguments. Love you. Mean it.